So I want to keep you on for a little longer and do like a second half to get squeeze money out of the people who are watching this, get them to go to Patreon and sign up to see the second half. Do you have another 35, 40 minutes? To sure. give? Okay. So uh, we'll talk about the post left maybe in, in this section. Oh boy. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see... We still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. So, Matt Christman is one of the hosts of Chapo Trap House and the man behind the Kush Vlog, which I believe premieres on Twitch and then is uploaded to YouTube. That's correct. Yeah, he is currently running a reading group on his vlog covering David Graeber and David Wingrow's 2021 book, The Dawn of Everything, a book that revises our understanding of the birth of civilization. And I'm glad to have him back on the podcast. Or I guess, in a way, this is your first visit to the new channel. So, Matt, thanks for coming on. Um, just to start with, why are you reading uh, the David Graeber book? What's the appeal right now? Uh, well, I've been myself finding myself reflecting more and more on uh, foundational questions of uh, human social order and how they came to be and been trying to figure out for myself sort of a thing that makes sense for me as a narrative for understanding those things. And this book coming out right now, it's, it seemed like a good uh, opportunity to uh, sort of refine my own thoughts by, uh, by striking them against uh, what uh, Graeber and Wing Wingrow are doing. So, mm -hmm. uh, so oh. we're pretty early in it, so, but we'll see. We haven't really gotten to the, to the really uh, enervating anarchist parts yet. Well, back in the nineties, I was an anarchist um, and uh, living in the Pacific Northwest. And at the time, one of the big trends in anarchism was to be a primitivist. Oh yeah. To turn against the first post left. Yes, the very first post left, which we'll we'll talk about the post left in a bit. If you have some information about it, uh, so you can clarify it for me, I'd really appreciate it because I have no idea what's going on with the post <laughs> left. Um, but uh, yeah, so I would imagine from what I've heard about from you, really about the Graeber book. So one of the things that he might be doing is overcoming this urge to become a primitivist by per saying that it's possible to have agricultural production and even maybe, I don't know, industrial production or at least some sort of uh, collective work um, without falling into a hierarchical, oppressive social order. Yeah, that, that does seem to be the, the significant thesis. That, that any, and that is, you know, a, a challenge to Marxism, certainly. So we'll see how... He develops it, but yeah, he's he's arguing so far that that different uh, modes of production do not deter, do not uh, necessitate uh, certain hierarchical social relationships. Well, I mean, it may be a challenge to Marxism. To me, it definitely reads like a challenge to primitivism because the primitivists would say, "No, we need to abandon agriculture, get back into the wild, abandon civilization." Like they're anti-civilization primitivists in the '90s who would run off into the forest and generally starve to death. Yeah. Uh, but, 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 but uh, it, so it would be a, it's a nice book for him to write for his fellow anarchists to, you know, keep them from that fate. Mm -hmm. But um, how do you see it as a challenge to Marxism? Well, because I mean, I think Marxism is like saying, yeah, we can have industrial society. We can have modernity without being hierarchical and oppressive and exploitative, but Know, yeah, but uh, a part of Marxism too, though, is the uh, uh, assertion that uh, it is the material relationships that structure our uh, social relationships. Oh, the, right. The, the chiefest of those is is the the mode of production. Mm. Right. Okay. Now I get you. 
Right. So uh, he's saying that, no, it, the, the mode of production changed, but the social changes didn't uh, start then. They started through, uh, through some sort of change in ideology. I mean, we'll get there. I haven't, I haven't gotten there yet. We'll see what he says. Okay. Um, yeah. The uh, my feeling about that is that my like my you know knee jerk Marxist defense against this suggestion is to say, well, you you know the mode of production uh, has to be looked at deeply, and that it always includes both a, a social organization and a technological change. So yeah. you might have. The, de the development of agriculture without uh, the kind of hierarchical arrangements that would turn that agricultural production into something that sustained larger social orders and also that was more hierarchical or something like that. But I, I'm basing that completely off the top of my head, you know, not without thinking it through very much. But um, I'm always wanting to defend Marxism, uh, especially from the likes of the late David Graeber. Yes, of um, course. <laughs> um, all right. So I want to talk about something closer to home, something we both kind of know a little bit about. I know a little bit. You probably know a lot. Uh, it's about podcasting and the sort of left space for podcasting. You're at the forefront of that, um, probably in, uh, unintentionally. Um, but back in the early days, you know, Chapo Trap House got a big push from the New Yorker. At least that's how I remember it. And last year, you seem to be getting in, attacked by the New Yorker, or at least criticized. Well, I mean, that New Yorker, the first New Yorker article wasn't terribly uh, uh, complimentary. Uh, it was sort of a concern troll that we were being insufficiently intersectional. Uh, oh, so it, it's like it was a it was a big deal to be in the New Yorker, you know. And there is this, especially at our point there. Any press is good press. It doesn't really matter what they're saying. It just matters they're saying something. But it's right. certainly the the angle for it was that was to see us as uh, sort of defiantly uh, white guys who, who defiant white guys who refuse to uh, accept like the reality of uh, of uh, non class basis of oppression. I mean, okay. gently, but that was, it was certainly not like a, Hey, these guys are, are awesome. Right. Okay. But yes, the, 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 the last one, uh, the, the most recent one uh, is certainly a, more of a direct uh, strike. And I, I, that one was I, very interesting because it shows the, the trajectory, not just of, you know, the relationship between uh, us and, and uh, the mainstream media or whatever, but just the way that podcasting has uh, become this sine qua non for like a uh, political identity uh, like that uh, in the absence of any movement on the political front, that consumption of podcasts has got, become uh, really the stand in for what your politics are, uh, which, you know, that was always part of it that was always uh a thing that i think uh drove people uh, um attracted people to political podcasts is the idea that it would be a way for people to people who felt political frustrations and uh and the desire for political change to imagine themselves part of a community but mm -hmm. for a while there there was a uh spoken and unspoken sense that that was part of a broader project, uh, which I think by now has gone away and all we're left with is the uh, consumer signaling. And so that article was basically saying, uh, you know, my, your leftism is basically determined by which podcast you listen to and, and therefore curating your podcast is very important towards is an important political act because of its reflection of you individually. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. I, um, you know, I started podcasting well before you did, I believe I started in 2009. Um, <clears throat> and back then to be a leftist podcaster, the socialist podcaster meant that you were uh, either talking to people who were 
a part of some sectarian Marxist group, like some truck group or, or communist group, or you just weren't talking to anybody on the left. Like I, I started out by getting myself onto podcasts that were like focused on psychedelics mm -hmm. because I felt like Marxism and socialism were about as far out as psychedelics at that yeah. moment. So, right. so might as well bring it to these people who could possibly have the imagination to listen. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, I, was uh, from the nineties in the Pacific Northwest. So I knew a little bit about like McKenna and, and Leary and all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and then it was around 2016 after I started working at zero that my little podcast got to be a little bit bigger, you know, got a somewhat larger audience, but I never felt this pressure to uh, become the kind of uh, political uh, pundit that people would identify with as defining their, their politics. I always wanted it to be like a little broader view of the left. I mean, cause my, or I want, here's two things I wanted either. Everyone, everyone should listen and the, regardless of where they were on the left or ultimately everyone should just believe exactly what I believed in whatever that moment was, you know, the okay. sect of one. But, um, uh, it's it, since then, you know, Trump has gone, Sanders is kind of gone and I feel like I've returned to 2009 in a way just sort of talking to whoever I can there are more podcasts around but it seems like it's the same kind of endeavor where you're you're trying to create something rather than uh entering into a, a field that's already got a direction do you feel something similar for yourself or do you feel really constrained by this notion that you have to fit into a slot that's already been constructed i think over the last i mean since uh the end of the sanders campaign we, we, i think every uh, left god i hate the word but it's accurate content creator uh has been challenged with how to integrate the the reality of of the of the irrelevance basically of the uh left as it's self-conceived online to the political process uh and in some respects it's very terrifying because it means that that political project you thought you were part of is not actually really happening but it's also kind of liberating because it <clears throat> does sort of take a little bit of the pressure off uh and allows you to uh refocus on the fact that at the end of the day this is an entertainment product and uh that if you're going to do politics uh, it can't be what counts for that. And that was something that we insisted on early on when the show started, mm -hmm. but that, you know, as, as the sort of uh, the mirage of the Sanders campaign came into focus, uh, it was very easy to imagine yourself part of an actual political movement with real uh, ability to influence things. Uh, mm -hmm. And that came with it, a real, uh, you know, sense of responsibility uh, and and anxiety, honestly, uh, that I mean, it was totally worth it because you felt like your words had this power. But now I feel like everybody has to come to terms with their relevance one way or the other. Mm. And uh, and yeah, so now the question is, how do you stay entertaining and truthful without uh, feeding the delusions of people who want to still think that we're uh that they're building something when they go online to uh, communicate their politics. Mm. Um, well, I'm thinking about the sectarian left in relationship to this, because, you know, let's say certainly after 1989, but really before then, uh, probably, you know, after 68, say, there was a feeling on the left of defeat, like a deep defeat. Um, and these sectarian groups, whether they were Trotskyist or, or Maoist or whatever flavor of Marxism or anarchism that they were, they continued on with not not saying to themselves, well, we're no longer political, but saying something like, OK, our job now is to educate, propagandize uh, uh, and and retain the vision. Mm hmm. Do you feel like maybe there you have something like that responsibility to put a message into the bottle 
for the future. It's Adorno would put it, or something yeah. Like I mean, we, I've talked about that uh, with with friends that 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 is how it feels. I mean, I know, and I personally have found myself very incapable of uh, feeling like I'm offering anything constructive in uh, analyzing the current political moment or certainly projecting it forward. So I'm finding myself much more focused on uh, history and on mm-hmm. trying to find something about the past that can be investigated in its totality due to the fact that it is past uh, and to tease out dynamics within it that can be applied to the current moment. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's that's how I personally have been uh, dealing with the uh, sort of the, the, the breakup and the decline of of uh, the political movement that I imagine myself part of. So how how old were you in 2011? Just when, about when Occupy, you were about 30. So were you part of? I uh, was I was there. The, uh, I went down like the second day in I was in New York and I went down to the second day to Zuccotti Park and I saw mm-hmm. them do the, the uh, General Assembly. I saw them do the the hand, the twinkle hands. There were a bunch of uh, topless women there with pa- uh, paint on them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember just feeling uh, a despair because it felt like a uh, sort of a self-conscious 60s retread. Uh, mm. that, and I couldn't imagine it having any real influence. And I ended up, I left and I was totally shocked by its persistence and how it grew. And I went back several times, but I never felt like I could contribute. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I was part of the peace movement in um, the early 2000s. I like organized and, and, you know, went, did marches. And one of the things that struck me then, even after nine 11 was that the left's response was right out of the seventies or, even late sixties, it felt like we should all be high and not shave our arm. You know, if you're a woman, not shave your armpits and certainly not if you're a man. And uh, just very much like it was a repeat. Um, and I did end up leaving uh, by, but with Occupy, because it was focused on class and on the financial sector, it wasn't just about uh, kind of emoting about the necessity for peace and, you know, against violence or emoting about overcoming racism or emoting about whatever it would be the issue of the day was, but actually like trying to strike at the uh, foundation a bit, at least that was the general aim. I felt, I felt pretty optimistic about Occupy despite how carnivalesque it was, you know, and how much it did have the aesthetic of the sixties. But then what struck me about it was not how long it lasted, but how it failed to deal with its own defeat. Mm-hmm. How long after people were still insisting that it was happening. Yeah. Even after they'd all been driven out of the park <clears throat> and how like retreats into basically reformist kind of legal maneuvering and helping organizations that you know, helping people stay in their homes was the, what they did. And so we're going right. to community organizing Yeah, how that wasn't, that wasn't addressed as a retreat. You know, it was, it was, you know, thought of as like a, uh, an advance or what we're doing next. And of right. course it was just a way for everything to be for the activists to become activists, professionalize, and then the, the rest just to kind of disperse. Yeah. Um, but, and, and I guess after with Bernie Sanders to kind of, it seemed like a lot of people when Sanders was running were preparing to have positions of power and authority within the new universe, within the white house or within the new media space that was being developed. Mm-hmm. There was talk of it even on mainstream channels. And that yeah. that's, that's really different from how Occupy felt like Occupy yeah. felt like it was like from the outside and we we're and there was an, a, a defined radical left that was attempting something. Whereas with the Sanders campaign, it was from the inside of the democratic party and it was a struggle. It was inside of it. And there was a new direction that might've been emerging within the democratic party. Um, So that made it seem more realistic. Uh, 
but I, I think the people who got defeated there got, got defeated on a much more direct and personal level too. Like yeah. if Michael Brooks was still alive, you know, I think I'm sure the, uh, the level of disappointment would be intense right now. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I don't know where I'm going. I'm just sort of talking. You can respond. Right. It's really- no, I, well, I think that that state, the, those like Occupy then Sanders, I don't think it could have really gone any other way because I mean, the left by that point and by the early aughts it had been completely routed and, and destroyed. The, the working class uh, base of the Democratic Party had been completely scattered. Uh, all you had really were individuals, uh, people from all walks of life and, and all class backgrounds uh, responding to the, the crisis of the non-recovery after 2008 with a, a relatively spontaneous desire to express some con- some resistance to the system as it existed, which, and because of the, the failure of the institutional left, uh, I think that they were going to almost, I think it's inevitable that they were going to be allergic to uh, demands and to structured politics because they had seen it fail. Uh, now, mm-hmm. lack of that also failed, but it had to be experienced, you know, uh, before mm-hmm. people could get over their uh, allergy to those structures and accept that it really is all we have uh, because uh, we simply don't have the uh, the capacity uh, in the face of this totalizing uh, capitalist system to uh, defeat it by uh, uh, demonstrating an alternative, which will always just be nestled within uh, the system and only be allowed uh, to the degree that it is not a threat. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, uh, uh, but, you know, there's that still didn't build a real constituency. And the Sanders campaign really was a, a mad dash for the controls. Uh, famously, this uh, Trump supporter wrote a infamous essay in 2016 where he compared the 2016 election to uh, Flight 93 and how the Democrats are going to crash the plane into the uh, White House or whatever, and that even though Trump is uh, a uh, obviously a imperfect vessel, uh, he's our only chance to grab the reins. Uh, that was much more, and of course, you know, that's ridiculous, the, the, the actual policies pursued by both parties, as we've seen now, mm. are basically identical. Uh, the Sanders campaign was a, a, get a desperate grab for uh, the top levels of power in order to build a working class movement that did not exist, which is inverting the process. But at this late date and with so few prospects on the ground, the only real option that felt available, it was the thing that was happening. Uh, and for a while, it did look like it was a going concern uh, and that it had a chance. Now, I remember when it looked like Bernie might actually get the nomination, at least to us, uh, I remember having to tell myself that I had to s- accept that uh, I was not going to be able to uh treat a, a Sanders presidency like any previous one and uh, and and be critical of it you know and, and provide and, and uh, distance myself from it in office even though it would immediately disappoint and immediately sell out in the ways that people were terrified of uh, and therefore you know implicate me morally which is what people were really scared of is that they would lose their sense of political virtue by mm. actually encountering power. Uh, and mm. that it would probably fail in most of its objectives, but that that failure was our really our only hope of building some capacity, some organizational energy uh, that could withstand the continuing uh, tightening of the neoliberal noose. Uh, so like even best case scenario, you're dealing with a, 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 a desperate uh grab for not even really power but for the hope of the ability to uh organize towards power even beyond sanders yeah 
Well, what I told myself was a different story. It was, well, I don't expect Sanders to actually be allowed to get the nomination. Um, but I thought they might get to a contested convention in which they'd have to like dir pretty directly take it from him. Like he would have an almost enough delegates to win and then they would play games with super delegates to take it away from him. That's what I kind of figured would happen and that it would do tremendous damage to the Democratic Party and disillusion many, many Democratic voters when that happened. And that, from my perspective, would be a great thing. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to kill off the the Democratic Party as any viable uh, party for the left or for the working class. Yeah. Um, uh, but unfortunately, I was wrong as well. I mean, maybe fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, I was completely wrong. And I was surprised at how and uh, how much solidarity there was uh, amongst the candidates to defeat Sanders. I was I I, I became a, a na naive whiner when <laughs> when that when that happened. We, when you were talking earlier, you said we can't create an alternative within this system that um, won't be nestled within it. And that's absolutely true. Like if you look at David Graeber's visions, like specifically of Occupy, the idea was to prefigure a new kind of politics and a new mm -hmm. kind of society. And by occupying these parks that, and that obviously won't work because of the very thing you pointed to. It has to be mm -hmm. supported by this system. But the working class movements and unions or radical unions, at, that has a chance to be nestled deeply within capital, in fact, be the source of capital's value, and also to change and, and, pre, and start to become a different kind of system. The degree to which the workers struggle for power uh, politically and, and, at, and in the workplace. I mean, that's why... Marx pointed to the proletariat as the revolutionary force because yeah. it could do exactly that. It would be the source of power within capitalism that, that you couldn't get rid of, they couldn't get rid of, and that then had the, the territory in which they could actually do political battle and change it. Right. So I just want to point that out. That yeah. So uh what is it you think that is holding back the the working class internationally and maybe in the United States from those kinds of political thoughts and attempts and, and are, or are they being held back? I mean, that's, there's a great resignation. There are these anti-mandate protests. What are we to make of these things? Uh, I, I think it, the thing holding back the working class is that there is no actual class experience in this country. Mm -hmm. I, uh, the, the, the reality of class is obviously undeniable the reality of, of 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 you know your life being organized primarily and above all else by your relationship to capital but in america certainly most most intensely but other uh advanced nations certainly in on a similar in a similar way if less intensely uh that subjective experience of class is is been completely eradicated. Uh, people are not experiencing the hardship and the alienations of, of capitalism in crisis as members of a class. They're experiencing it as individuals, members of a basically a consumer demographic tranche and their mm -hmm. relationship to each other is according to those demographic consumer models. And mm -hmm. they're uh, uh, hostility to the system and their resistance to it are also expressed uh, according to uh, that consumer identity. And that's not their fault. Like that's, I think one of the big things that makes it very difficult to talk about this stuff in a way that's constructive is there is this smuggled in moralism that uh, even people who consider themselves like hardcore materialist Marxists uh, fall victim to where they, the idea of like the working class as uh, somehow like virtuous uh, as, as containing uh, some 
uh, transcendent uh, values, uh, as opposed to, you know, the group who have the capacity to uh, experience and express class consciousness in a way that can effectively uh, challenge capitalism. Uh, but that's only in conditions where they are all experiencing alienation as members of a class. And that, mm -hmm. that is certainly how Marx uh, imagined uh, the experience of being a working class person uh, uh, intensifying over time. Mm -hmm. But in the United States, anyway, the process of uh, the 20th century process of suburbanization uh, and, uh, and mass media have have really turned us into uh i call i say instead of the potatoes in the sack of of uh rural france in the 19th century the pringles in the tube of american like uh post-industrial society where where we are not workers we work but we are not workers mm -hmm. uh, and that means that the the organizing uh power of events that should be the the first and most important element in building uh, working class power uh, does not have the effect of intensifying class consciousness because there is none there to be intensified. Yeah. Um, I think it, there, there's, there's this columnist named Thomas Friedman who used to always refer to little anecdotes that he picked up from his uh, cab driver. So he would tell stories based on, you know, oh, what yeah. cab driver would tell him, well, I'm turning into, I've recently divorced, I'm dating through apps. So I'm turning into this guy who will always refer to a, a woman he met through Tinder as my version of the cab driver. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so, I, so I, I had a short uh, back and forth. I didn't even actually go on a date with uh, a, a rural woman lives out of town uh, who had a working class job in the service sector. Like I'm going to, for the sake of uh, uh, anonymity, I'd say she worked like as a manicurist. Wasn't quite what she did, but, and she was out of work. She was looking for a job. She had actually moved back to Oregon. She had done, man she was a manicurist somewhere else. And um, we talked on the phone about this. And what she talked about was the people she knew who could help her find work. And those people included people who were starting manicure salons, you know, starting these nail salons, as well as other workers. There was no distinction in her thinking because it was just about finding work again. It wasn't about defining herself through what she consumed. It was about she was still defined like she repeated to me, like, I hate not having a job. I feel worthless, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, I, I, she was defined by her work. She had done it for a long time and actually felt good about it. And like, it was a skill she had and she was better than most. And, but uh, she, and she hated not being employed. And she also was very disdainful for people who like would tell her, well, you could get food stamps. You can get unemployment. And she's like, no, fuck that shit. I, I'm, I go to work. That's what right. I do. Right. Um, so, but on the other hand, when I pointed out to her, like, you know, with COVID and the inflation, and it's not your fault. This is happening across the board to a lot of people. Her response was to say, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. What, what the <laughs> fuck good does that do me to, to, for you to tell me that? Thank you, professor. So uh, <laughs> literally, that's what she told me. And um, so uh, I guess what I'm getting at is I think that the problem is actually maybe not just a matter of the consumer identity, but also just the fact that for a worker who's out of work or who, who's struggling to get a higher wage, the institutions that they would maybe turn to aren't there. Yeah. Like, you know, that there was no way for her to, to work with other workers to collectively do shit, yeah. you know? Uh, but so she had to be kind of like an entrepreneur herself. Yeah. And, and she got a job within like, Three days later, she texted me like, oh, yeah, I got hired. So. Yeah, I mean, a lot. most people cannot afford to pine for political solutions to their economic problems because in the meantime, they have to 
pay bills and right. they have to uh you know just keep a roof over their head and and that that pro that uh privileges uh, embracing grind set, you know, embracing the idea that that you really you really are on your own, and therefore uh, political uh, whining or pining or anything is uh, only a waste of time uh, that could be spent uh, finding something uh, through your own efforts. Because the message that has been sent pretty loud and clearly over the past ten years, certainly. Uh, from every institution uh, in this country is that you are completely on your own. Yeah. Uh, and that, that any political help uh, is going to, uh, uh, is a chimera, is, is a fantasy. It's, it's a cynical fraud being uh, dangled in front of you by people who uh, really only want to uh, pick your pocket. And it's very difficult to argue with people that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like that was, I feel like I, I do think that the thing that doomed the Sanders campaign was the success of the Obama campaign. Uh, I feel like Obama was uh, the last person to get an honest hearing uh, to, uh, uh, to pitch a political change mm -hmm. uh, to regular people. And the result of that was a complete betrayal that left people worse off than before, but now saddled with a bunch of uh, 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 cultural guilt because uh, while the prospect of politics making anybody's life better is completely uh, dismissed uh, in, because we have to face the reality uh, of life under capitalism, uh, the need to... Uh, express virtuous politics uh, is more important than ever, uh, even though it has no actual bearing on your your life or material conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so by the time Bernie shows up, he's, he gets a great hearing among uh, young people who were too young, for the most part, to have been disappointed by Obama. Uh, but everyone else uh, who is not, you know, ideologically committed to the Democratic or Republican parties uh, and maybe would and would definitely support in abstract uh, a social democratic turn in American politics has no faith uh, in the program and no desire to be uh, made a chump again. Right. I would say that I, I think you're probably right, but I just I remember the Obama campaign pretty well. Of course, you do, too. Um and uh, during the nominating process of the three candidates who had any shot, Obama was not the furthest to the left. That was John Edwards, who was talking about, you know, two Americas, the uh, rich and the poor, the working class and the ownership class. Uh, Edwards was the one who was who was more interested in revitalizing the working class part of the Democratic Party. And Obama, to me, seemed like uh you know what what did he have going as as his left credentials that he was black i guess but also that he was had been hadn't been in office when the debacle yeah, he, he didn't have the, a, a record no i mean it was okay. all it was all marketing uh yeah. and and in the primary it basically it was marketing that appealed to yeah young people uh yeah. and it, it had no uh it had nothing to it but the uh crisis the the economic crisis happens just uh during the just at the moment of the presidential election uh, right when he's already the candidate they, they have to like pause the campaign yeah to yeah and it's after he got the nomination yes so yeah, like yeah. he in that moment of crisis got to stand in for this vague concept of change and yeah it didn't have a lot of ideological uh meat to it but what what does in a presidential election i mean these are branding exercises. Uh, and he was the brand of populist reform. No, right. no content, but just the brand of it. Mm -hmm. And populist reform turned out to be recapitalizing the banks, kicking millions of people out of their homes, and basically refusing to actually re allow the economy to recover in any meaningful way. 
and continuing to people. push tax cuts. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's just a you know, yeah, there was very, very little difference between the, the two in terms of the major issue of the day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um uh so listen, we we've been talking for about 40 minutes. I want to keep you on for a little longer and do like a second half to get squeeze money out of the people who are watching this, get them to go to Patreon and sign up to see the second half. Do you have another 35, 40 minutes to sure. give? Okay. So uh, we'll talk about the post left maybe in, in this section. Oh boy. 